exactly. <laughs> Everyone's got the same shot. You can vote on Gretkin. Here. Moore. Here. Shaner. Here. Gott. Here. Waters. Here. We stand for a moment of silent prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, please. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no interviews and there are no proclamations. Oh, oh, there is an interview. I'm sorry, Jay. civil service. Jay Dorsch Dorschner. Jay, come on up and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to Thank you. serve on the civil service commission. Plug in. My Hi, was I'm dead. Jay Dorchner, and I, there was an ad downstairs looking for volunteers last year, and I was going to, but my health wasn't very good, so I wanted to get that better. And last month, I talked with Heidi, and she steered me toward the Civil Service Commission, so that's what I'm doing today. I don't have the, nobody gave me anything, oh. but I read it earlier. Get me. This has to be gender balanced, right? This one? Yes. Yes, yeah. it does. Balance. And I believe they need one male. It was because Ken Quidwell had to resign. Yeah. I don't need it. Jay, while you're standing there now, I'll, I'll share with you where the mayor's looking. Uh, I uh, sit in as a council representative on the Civil Service Commission meetings, and I was asked by the Civil <coughs> Service Commission uh, previously to emphasize the importance of attendance at meetings. And I will tell you that uh, they're, they're one of the very active committees. Uh, they they um, approve all applications, listen to appeals, um, and, and also participate in testing, civil service testing processes. Mm -hmm. So they get called on a lot. And it's That's important that if you're there uh, a member, they, they really need you to help participate. I so time. I just wanted to share that and make sure you knew what you were getting into. Yeah, my father served on the commission in town north of here for many years, so great, I'm familiar a little great. bit with it. I well, I appreciate you. Those. <laughs> Runs in the blood, yeah. No, no. I appreciate you uh, filling out an application. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've only lived in Sioux City about eight years, but I'm familiar with it. I grew up in Orange City. and. Now I'm here and my family's here, my grandkids are here, so I'm moved back and Is that what great. brings you to Sioux City is your grandkids and your family? My daughter I have two daughters here and six grandkids, seven grandkids. Oh. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Well, let's you know. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Will you be contacting me then, Heidi? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll go to consent agenda three through 11 C, consider them to pass unanimously. Uh, if you want to speak on an item, please come up as I read it, state your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not under, not on the agenda, please come up under, under citizen concerns. Again, state your name and address for the record. I'll move the consent. Second. Three is the reading of the city council minutes of February 25th and 29th and March 2nd, 2020. Four is a resolution temporarily closing various streets in the downtown area on May 30th, July 14th, and August 7th for the Hard Rock Battery Park Concert Series. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to share that um, Mike Adams, um, I, I was at the MERD meeting Friday morning and he came over and asked me if I would just share with the council. Uh, he apologizes for he and Doug Fisher, the new general manager, not being able to be here but they had meetings to attend in, to, or attend in Des Moines. And he wanted to let, um, ask me to share with you that the Hard Rock will be hosting for sure three contracts that they have already signed <clears throat> in Battery Park. They have one verbal consent um, already to do a fourth one and they'd like to get a fifth one. But um, uh, he also said that uh, in the contract, they, they're very conscious of the uh, noise level and the decibel level, and they will continue to monitor, and the acts coming know that, that they need to keep it in line. So uh, he just uh, asked me again to just share so we are aware of it, and they appreciate all that uh, 
the city has helped them with, so um, they're really looking forward to a, a, an upcoming a, a great concert series. And I need to abstain on that item, conflict of interest. Where are the scouts from today? I forgot to ask you that earlier, sorry. Two oh four. Where's that at? Um, the Church of okay. Welcome. Um, it's, um, it's All right. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Five is a resolution approving a payment to Cornhusker International Trucks for repairs to a dump truck. What year is the dump truck? Dave DeLong, Fleet Supervisor. Uh, it's a 2014. And how do you blow up a diesel engine in this day and age? You really got to work at it. Well, that one had a failure of a antifreeze line, and it was driven across town back into the shop that way instead of called and being towed. And so somebody drove it with the... Drove it dry. Yeah. $26,000 error versus a thousand dollar tow or whatever it would be or yeah I guess I would like to know what measures we've taken with our employees Mike as long as you're here to make sure those things don't happen again I wouldn't think we would even have to tell employees that but I'll follow up unless yeah I don't know what the dump trucks do if they alert you or if he or she knew what the leak was but yeah that's a costly error there is a alarm that goes off uh, letting the drivers know there is an error going on um, don't know how it was investigated uh, the time we got the call it was already getting driven in too late we are changing all the hoses on all the other units though to just to be sure this don't happen again as a precautionary. So what, like a direct line or something? Or What's that? Direct line or just something where it can't come loose? Or was it just it, That one actually or? just brought it out. It was just getting old. So we're just replacing them all just to be pre, uh, get ahead of it. Six is a resolution fixing the amount to be assessed for the 2019 right-of-way tree trimming program. I would say this. I'd like to make sure that truck doesn't like... You're on a five-year cycle or seven-year cycle, right? Don't come back with that truck to be replaced now for a while. <laughs> okay. Well, don't come back at 10 years either because this should extend its life, right? Brand new engine. All right. <clears throat> Sevens are actions relating to grants. A is a resolution authorizing an application with FTA for the low or no emission program. Eight is a resolution authorizing Parks and Rec to apply for a grant with the, from the IDNR Land and Water Conservation Fund for the Chris Larson Park Riverfront Redevelopment. C is a resolu resolution authorizing the Police Department to apply for a grant from the Department of Public Safety for overtime hours, education, and travel. Actions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving a consulting services agreement with DGR Engineering for North Valley Crossing Regional water, Stormwater Detention Improvements. I would like to vote on that, please. Moore. Aye. Chainer. Aye. Scott. No, I'm, and the reason I'm voting no is it's another classic. We just give it to a firm. We, <coughs> we don't ask for proposals around here. And I, and I want to make sure that they're not coming back for any more money for construction. This is all in. I'll take a little of that if you believe they aren't, but go <laughs> ahead. Waters. Aye. Gretkin. Aye. B is a resolution approving a change order to the contract for RP constructors for the North Hanger area drainage basin and drainage improvements project at the airport. Mike, I was just wondering, can you explain what this, and if I missed a memo, I apologize, but. No, this, um, this was actually due to bids coming in significantly under the initial estimate. So we got two bids for this initial project, and this is a state grant funded project. So yeah. the state actually allowed us to go back and kind of increase the adjacent Expand. area to fulfill the whole grant. So we're drawing down the full grant funds and the pavement around it is in just as bad a shape. Cool. So that's uh, B and C, right? Isn't that going together? Right, exactly. Thank you. He is a res resolution awarding a service provider agreement to quality striping for the airport water blasting project. 
I'm sorry. Well, I think you need to do C yet. D. Yeah, yeah I got to do. Oh, C. You didn't do C either. Yeah. C is resolution approving a work order to R and S and H for the North Hangar area of drainage basin and drainage improvements project. D is a resolution awarding a contract to RP constructors for the Myrtle Street reconstruction project. What was the engineer's estimate? And again, I don't understand why when we've included always that this one doesn't get included. Uh, I did ask staff after you brought the question up and there was some confusion about whether we can, at what point we can release it. We're gonna get clarification from DOT. This, I will say though, this was Wait a minute, you're warning, if we award, that, that's a public document today then. But, it, but you could reject it, and then we're not supposed to release it if it's been rejected. That's why they're not on rejects. So we're going to get clear. I'll get clarification and let you know how, when we're supposed so that you, to. So you can know that, because you know it, but this council can't until after we award. What the engineer's estimate, it can't be public released. I can send you a confidential email saying what it is, but... Well, I asked the question early today, so. Well, I didn't know it at the, t at the time you asked the question what the engineer's estimate was off the top of my head. So I can get you a text saying what it was or an email. You can do that after we take the vote on the main. You, you did that on Glen Avenue, boys, I'm pretty sure. We, I think Glen, it didn't have it on there, but we went back, Morningside had it on there and some other ones. So we're gonna get clarification from DOT and I will let you know what their opinion is on what, what point we should be really releasing the engineer's estimate. It was less than 15% over the engineer's estimate was the bid. But 15% on six million is a million it's, bucks. It's a, it's a, it so was. So where do we get the million bucks? Because the state's only gonna fund what they had originally thought, just like Glen Avenue. So this million is ours. It, it is ours, to, it's above what our grant application. And I'm, I'm gonna vote no then, because <coughs> we don't have a million. Where, 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 are we, where are you finding a million dollars? It's gonna come out of our, our infrastructure reconstruction. We'll shuffle things around. If we have to push things back, we'll push them back. What would your preference be? We're recommending that it be the border. We don't think if we rebid it, we're gonna get a lower price. Any lower, yeah. It's not I like we defer for one week, because I wanna know what projects you're going to kick out, because those, have an impact on what you guys think we're doing here. It's not fair to other parts of town necessarily to not know what's going to come out because something has to come out. Yep, something's got to, we got to move things around. Delaying this one more week uh, will push, can push this project that much farther into a third year if need be because they're, we're running tight on the schedule as it is for this. We can't even talk to the contractor at all until it's awarded by the city and by the DOT. Once that happens, then we can tell them to go ahead with this construction of this project, but otherwise we've lost, we'll lose some valuable time here for construction. You're saying that, that is week, one of the repercussions. You're saying that a week will push it into their late another. start date is the beginning of April. This, <clears throat> unfortunately, this contract has to get awarded by us, sent to DOT, awarded processed, by then back to us for approval before they can start. So there is a What's concept. the turnaround on that process? A couple weeks. Yeah, it could take a couple of weeks. Getting that close if it's March 16th when we take it up. And then the contractor still has to order parts. But we are talking a little over a million dollars. Well, it's it, mm -hmm. 700,000 <coughs> was what it was over. Which I guess I just backed you into the estimate. Yeah. And we're going to have to utilize that grant money, or we want to use that money. That grant right? money has to be used on Myrtle. Yeah. Unless we go back through the TIP and all that process. This is a two-year project, too. It was a very large project. They were going to do half this year, half next. We knew all this going in, boys. We could have bid it in an earlier letting if we'd have gotten our act together. So I don't have any sympathy. Huh. I'm sorry, but this this project was okay. Yes, you, well, you had a you had a you had a preliminary way back last summer. Then last fall, we went out there to that church again, and that was three months ago. There were lettings between then and now. There's a whole process we have to have our. I, I, I get mean, it. I it, understand. It's the not that letting. simple. So, anyway, there's no second, so I'll just call for the vote on it then. Shainer? Aye. Or yes. Scott? No. Waters? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. 
I would like to know what the state says because you guys have had it different around here constantly. We ought to do it the same way every time. Resolution awarding a service provider agreement to Quality Striving for the Airport Water Blasting Project. Nine is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Logan <laughs> Contractors for one wheel loader. B is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Charles Grabus Ford for one Ford Ranger. I had a question about that one. I, I still get kind of surprised by city processes, you know what I mean, coming from private sector then to this. This is for inspection administration, right? And being yeah. able to go out and it's saying that it only has six useful years. And I understand it's been used for nine, so I appreciate that. I want, but my whole point is how rough is this truck that then we need to spend another 25K to get a new one. You know what I mean? Like I just, I don't see vehicles going yep. that bad. And I understand the argument for disrepair or <laughs> more costly to replace or, you know, to fix and everything goes wrong. I totally understand depreciation like that and how those, those costs can increase. But gosh, a 2011 Chevy Colorado is really in that rough a shape inspection administration. You know, I mean like some of the parks trucks with plows on them, I get that yeah. turnover, but what are your feelings on this? Uh, on this particular truck, overall to look at it, it's not in bad shape. Yeah. It has well over 120,000 miles on it. Yeah. So we're getting up there at the point where it's gonna be uh, more costly for repairs. But what? I mean, as far as just, I mean, are you thinking brakes, tires? What, what becomes more costly? You know what I mean? Obviously, if the engine goes out, I understand. You know, Your or transmission, transmission, yep, transmission, things like that maybe. But it's like, is, the, is what we get on the auctioneers or on the city auction website that great that it's like we shouldn't just run it into the ground if it's still running well? We actually get really good money off of the gov deals uh, for the auction units. Uh, that, that truck alone will probably bring, you know, three or 4,000 by itself. But I get that, but then you're spending 25. I, I guess, Mayor, you've been around longer. Has it always been this process or anyone else <clears throat> have input on that? I just. My input is I don't feel like 120,000 is that many miles nowadays. I mean, everything's fuel injected, et cetera, et cetera. I know on our business, we drive a lot longer than that. I just think that with all of our vehicles, you know what I mean? I just don't. That's something actually Dave and I have talked about actually trying to increase our mileage on our vehicles to get longer life out of them. Yeah, and to, to have that constant turnover, everyone wants to drive a new vehicle and you know not have any issues. But like we said, with the exception of a tranny or a <clears throat> engine or something, you know what I mean? Like these aren't huge costs and you save. Yeah. I think we can look at the policy um, I think, you know, CMG probably has fallen the policy as established and it's a fine line. If we can get, we can probably get another year out of it. We might not. So they just go to replace these things as prescribed. So and, we should go back. And when you say, to, when you say a year or so, I mean, is, are you thinking transmission or an engine then? I mean, when you get up in that area. It can nickel dime you to death at the same yeah, time. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I get that too. But gosh, you would think like, I think of police cruisers and stuff like that, you're getting regular oil changes. I'm, I'm assuming none of these vehicles have ever missed an oil change. No, no, no. You know, no. so it's like they're really staying on top of that. You'd think that. Most of your money uh, actually comes from your emission problems. Once you get in that upper mileage, you start having the emission issues and that's where the money comes in. The what issues? The emission. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where it starts getting costly. You start replacing O2 sensors and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. stuff Can I like ask that. what year this vehicle is that we're getting rid of? 2011. Is that our deal on pickups now, eight years? Six. Uh, well, in this particular one, six, just because of the mileage, but uh, it's typically on a 10, 10 year. Mike, do we just want to defer this? Because this was really a department decision. They've amortized it and then they want to replace it and get a report back from them why they think it's due for replacement. You sure can if you'd like some more information on, you know, just bring it back. It, well, and I'm just, I'm just trying to be clear. It's like uh, a bigger picture conversation too, that it's like, gosh, is it really necessary? You know what I mean? If we can save the 25K here and there and put it off for another year, if it, and then sometimes you don't have a transmission go out or you don't have engines, you know what I mean? Just some of them run a little longer and yeah, sure. If, if, 
If we can defer and look into this one, I appreciate it. But Mike, to your point, I would appreciate looking at that policy or just updating and see what we can do to extend the longevity of the or lifely and lifetime of these vehicles. Great. Yep. Thank you. So I would make a motion to defer this for a week. For a week? Two weeks. What would you like, Dave? A week. Yeah, defer for one week, please. Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Thank you. See, is a resolution awarded a purchase order of Beersbach equipment and supply for four trench and shoring boxes. D is Stu Hansen Dodge Jeep D1 through 3 are resolutions awarded <coughs> purchase orders to Stu Hansen Dodge City Jeep for various pickup models. I had a question or concern. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of us did. And sorry to keep bringing you up here, buddy. Um, my question, I think, is two parts. Am I reading this correctly? We don't have to do all of them or nothing, right? We can do individual vehicles with different companies. Yes. And I guess the reason I'm getting to it is because, number one, everyone probably noticed that the Jensen dealership was close enough or within that range that we could award it to them Yes. Um, with to be more local. Um, but then the other two can still use that other dealership, correct? Yeah, we put them all in separate requisitions, so yeah, we can use whatever we'd like. Okay, so I would make a motion to accept the bid from Jensen Motors. Second. The second low bid. Because they've, yeah, they've got three. Bids. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank second you. low bid. Yes, the second low bid, I knew that thank you. Your intent. Waters? Aye. Bretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Shainer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Tender applications for beer and liquor license. See the list come forward if you have questions. 11, receive them. That's it for you. <laughs> receive a minute, see the list, and come forward if you have questions. This is the end <clears> of the consent <throat> agenda. Anyone want to be heard again on any of those items, please come forward. <clears right now. throat> Seeing none, we'll vote electronic. Passes 5 0. 12 is an ordinance amending a rezoning 4001 and 4003 Military Road. The petitioners, Alan Fagan, PNZ, recommends approval. First consideration approved February 24th. Need a motion, need a uh, motion for a second reading. I'll move the second reading. Is there a second? Second. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Brent Nelson, uh, senior planner. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring you up to speed with uh, exactly what we've been going on. We've accomplished a few things. Uh, please bear with me. I'm not usually, I don't usually do this. I usually let, let Jeff do that. Um, again, <laughs> or he doesn't let me, one of the two. Um, again, the first thing, and I believe we have some uh, consensus on that is that the driveway would take access, the, dri the shared driveway for the two northerly lots would take access near Hale Street, uh, which is down in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, as you can see, 30th Street there, uh, it's very narrow. Uh, there's enough room for two cars to meet, but just barely. So uh, uh, that won't take care of the, uh, moving the driveways won't take care of the issue, but it will keep it from getting worse. Um, I've had some questions about the uh, potential, or the uh, driveway in this area. Um, again, we're doing a rezoning and a, a plat, a minor subdivision. So we have to make a lot of our decision, uh, design decisions, um, make a lot of assumptions for them. Um, I'm going to have Al uh, Fagan uh, stop up in a second uh, to take a look, uh, to go through a, a drawing with you. Uh, but it appears to me that we have uh, about four foot of clearance in the area and a, and a 36 inch pipe that would take care of the driveway. That should uh, obviously work pretty well. The detention for this area would be between uh, the driveway and the property line. Um, we'd have to be detaining, again, basing on average homes and, and average uh, uh, driveways and such. We'd have to be detaining about, uh, 
know, 274 cubic feet and releasing at 74. That uh, will have to be designed, but we should be able to do it. Um, one of the significant issues we had is uh, uh, maintenance of 30th Street and Bennington Road. From this point, basically from the bottom of the, uh, the PowerPoint there, oh, about 3,600 feet to the north and west. Uh, neighbors have suggested uh, vacating this and forming a homeowners association to provide a, a mechanism for maintenance. I believe that's the way to go. Uh, there's about 150 different uh, issues to work out, but uh, simply having a street with no mechanism for maintenance is not a good idea. And I think working with uh, Mr. Kleinschmidt and the neighbors, assuming we can get all those issues worked out, is probably the best way to find, uh, to provide a maintenance mechanism. Um, I realize we, there's a number of concerns about topography and whether this is supposed, uh, whether this property should be built at all, or developed at all. Um, and uh, it is very rough, there's no question about that. Um, the reason we recommended the rezoning was uh, because the comprehensive plan uh, called for uh, suburban residential development. But we're in the middle of a comp plan rewrite anyhow. If this uh, is unusually or excessively steep, uh, rough, we can do two things. One is to revise the, uh, revise the plan, or revise the, the uh, long use, the long range land use. And two, um, a number of entities, Plymouth County and Woodbury County for one, have uh, restrictions in their zoning ordinance that would uh, uh, limit development on rough land. So we'd look at, uh, I don't know if that takes care of anybody's concerns, but uh, I think we'd be looking at those two items anyhow. Uh, we have had uh, some suggestions at the off-site streets, probably in this case 30th, uh, be brought up to uh, standards whenever a subdivision abuts it. Um, that's quite a policy change. Uh, it w we wouldn't be the first one that would require paving and bringing those up to city standards, uh, especially if one or more lots take access off of them. Uh, we can look at that, <clears throat> but I'd like to look at that for quite some time because that's a huge uh, policy change. Not to, not to say that it's not a good idea, but it's a big change. And uh, finally with that, um, I'd like to have Alan, uh, Mr. Fagan, stop up and uh, Show you the show you the deten uh, the drainage. <clears throat> the reason I have this area on the the overhead is because roughly the area outlined in the dots is what flows to this corner. Some of it comes down here, flows to hail, some here, and so on. The house locations I we just had to take make some assumptions. It's a, it's, a, it's a minor subdivision. We looked at the hilltops. Uh, we also figured in the, the drainage uh, from the, uh, you know, driveways and such. Um, and so that is, seems to be the, the major issue is the north corner. And uh, Alan um, has done some review of the, the drainage and I'll uh, let him explain it. Can you put that on the projector? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you for letting me speak on this subdivision. Five lot subdivision, there's six and a half to nine acre lots. The big concern seems to be the northeast corner of lot four. Um, <coughs> you can't project that? Takes them I have handouts, I can, I can give you a- It'll come up, it just takes a minute. So the, the concern seems to be the northeast corner of lot four, how we gain access onto 30th Street. This is, uh, we submitted a topo of the entire site at our pre-plat conference. 
This is a blow up of just this area. The street going north is Hale Street, the east west is 30th Street. We're talking about a 150 foot east west stretch from that intersection for this entrance. The entrance that's actually there right now is about 65 foot west of Hale Street. There was a question at the last meeting about the elevation change from, from 30th Street going south. It drops down two feet and 21 feet, and then it goes back up. As you can see, I have spot elevations on there from 1280 to 1281. So it is fairly level in there. The topo <coughs> indicates that water runs east on the north side of 30th Street and the south side of 30th Street. The water on the north side of 30th Street comes to a 24 inch corrugated metal pipe. It crosses southerly and then heads east again. Mr. Fagan, could you step over there and sure. maybe use your pen to show us you what you're actually speaking on, just so I can follow it? So by, by elevations and the mm -hmm. topography, I have arrows on here. You can see the water runs easterly to this tube and then it crosses, goes east. On the south side, follows this arrow, comes along here, south side of these trees. There's a dike along here that prevents the water from going onto this property owner. I talked to him and he does maintain this area. He, he had to dig that out slightly when it, you know, there's a lot of water in here. So it does need to be maintained, there's no doubt about that. But the water works, this comes down here, it will not go over this dike. And here is the pro proposed entrance in this location. We talked about the slope coming down this entrance, it's fairly level from here to here, about 80 feet. There's room to put a, a, a tube in here or if two tubes are required. There was talk about could they plug up with branches. I don't think these structures are any di different than any other uh, structure <clears> that <throat> water, but I would assume that whoever lives here, if they see that this is plugging up, would unplug it so their, so their entrance doesn't wash out. Would that be the 136 inch culvert that he was talking about? Brent <coughs> talked about a 36 inch. I don't know if that's the proper size structure or if it takes 224. That has to be approved by the city when the entrance is approved. Living in the country, I know that one is always better than two as far as letting debris go through, right? Sure. Okay. But, uh, but, the, but the topo indicates that an entrance or those structures could be placed in there to allow that water to continue. Um, there was also a comment at the last meeting that the water can cross and go onto this property, property to the north. The road at this, at this location, it does drop three tenths by elevation. The water could go from the south side of the road across. Is there enough water to go into that house? It would take a lot of water, it looks like to me, but that house is fairly low too. But that's not Brad's water that's getting over there. That's the water coming down 30th Street. <coughs> At this point in time, I would, I would take any questions that you have of me. Questions? Can we put the page back on that shows where you <coughs> possibly the houses may be built? Because do I see a holding pond there? This area right here, the one prior to this one that had the it was on the on the it was on a projector. Oh, that was on or okay. not the projector. That was on it your was a laptop. PowerPoint. Um, again, oh, okay. when, when yep. we did this, we worked uh, to try to find out how, what area drained where, mm -hmm. and then we tried to put some assumptions here. All we're doing right now is splitting lots. I don't have d house design. I don't have right. house locations. Was this they, oval over here to the right? Is that a watershed or what is that? That area down uh, in there? Yes. That is the lower area that's roughly bounded by a dike uh, or a berm that um, Alan showed on, on his drawing. Yes, that's where any detention is going to have to stay. 
but until we get design and something to base our design on, I can't tell you how much. But that's not naturally there, that'll have to be built, or it's already no, that, that's naturally there. It holds there. water now. Was it, it created, man-made, or was it? It holds the water from going to the east, but you still, what she's asking is, will it slow it down, I think, as a detention pond, right. heavy water in, lighter coming out. That's what I think she's yes, asking. Yes, it will. This is the water flow, so if there's too much water, it will stay in this area until it can, until it can get out, of, out into this ditch. And again, the, the, the outflow size will have to be designed. So the gray oval that I was just looking at is equal, whoops, you can <laughs> put it back to the, to the topography, the other one that Mr. Fagan brought. That blue, that blue area is... Yeah, that's, that's what I just was checking. I want to make sure that those two are the same. Yes. Okay. But it'll, it's not going to slow down, Alan. If you've got a 1278 going to a, two, two, a 1276, you've got to have some sort of a... You've got to have a... If, if you, you, you've got to have it as low as that. You've got to be... The base has got to be at least 1276. I'm practicing engineering here, but... But just north of that 1278 contour, you see a 1277, so it dropped a foot there. And then in this distance, which is probably 150 feet, that's, that's 1276.5, so only dropped a half a foot. And then in about the same distance, it drops a half a foot I, to get the end of that tube. So it's fairly flat. It, that's my point. It's yeah. flat. It You've got to build there? a pond to let it... Uh, but, but this, with this dike there, it is a pond. It's a pond going to the east. You don't dump on that farmer or that house below. Right. <clears throat> but the water's all going to run in a big rainstorm. It's going to go across the street. I, I know enough about detention ponds to be dangerous, but it has yeah. to be a pond that holds water that comes and lets out slower. That's what we were just talking about in an engineering meeting earlier. It's, it, so you have to somehow pond that there. But, but the edge of the road is, is uh, 12, 1282. I, it doesn't matter. The, our ordinance requires that, I'm just telling you, when you bring the plans back and the engineers look at it, am I right? You're the, you guys are the engineers. There's, it's got to be a desk. pond. Yeah. I'm just telling you that. Yeah, so. when, when the house gets built through DRC, we will review the size and everything and in, right. ensure that the pond there, one, holds the 100-year storm, and right. two, has a smaller pipe out, that lets outlet. it out at a 10 year right. end of right. rate. But there's not an outlet built into it right now. This is all natural that's right. there. Well, there's uh, one of the neighbors dug an outlet, but it'll have to be. A real one will have a to real be established. One. Yes. Right. I just don't want to <laughs> go into this feeling like we've already resolved it all, you know, by looking at the photos and not you know, for myself, understanding what it, am I exactly looking at? Is this really a solution to the problem? And I feel like we're getting there, but I don't feel like we're there yet. But none of that has to be, you know, I'm not saying you have to show that pond. I'm just saying down the road, you're going to have to show some sort of pond, I, I think. We will require that at the DRC, or uh, Development Review Committee meeting, okay. before we issue the permits. Other questions for Alan? Okay, anyone else want to be heard? <clears throat> Jeremy Kleinschmidt, 4000 Bennington Road. Hey Brent, could you put the first picture that you showed of that road with the... Oh, can we go back to the PowerPoint? Sorry. That. So see how flat that is? So they're saying we can put a 36 inch culvert there, but you're gonna have a 36 inch bank alongside that blacktop to, make, to have the water go into that culvert? And I, again, I don't know that you can address all the grading and drainage okay. issues, but, but to answer your question, it sounds like from his drawing that you're gonna build the road up and put a tube underneath the road is that what I'm understanding? The, the driveway. Yeah. Yes. Right. So to answer your question, the road will become a natural barrier, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be almost like a dam. It'd be that part of it. Drain yeah. out slower. So yes. Okay. So then, you were saying we're going to build that road up to put the culvert in. 
and go into that land, that land for an entrance. So then you're taking the volume of that ditch of the water retention pond of the amount of water it will hold. Last year, water did go over that berm that we said that no water did go over it. It did go over it last year. Because it went through its basement. But we just said the water then will have to drain into a holding pond It'll the, and be released slower than what it was last year under the storm. Yeah, that storm we had last year had to have been a 500 year flood event. It, right. We had rain on top of snow on top of, and there was a lot. And yes, we did have some but that happened bonding in the town. area, but uh, this will be designed so it releases into that uh, ditch along 30th Street on the east side of Hale. But I think the question Does that makes sense. That water is going to run out of underneath the driveway into a detention <clears throat> pond, then be released, correct? No, no. I expect all the a lot of the water to run. Uh, this the dotted line is the ridge line. I expect mm -hmm. it to run to about here. To there not will, even there get will to be, the driveway. So where's the water that's coming by the driveway? It just sits there. It's, it's the I can water see that running along, down the road. along here. Yeah, there. Um, there's not much. The majority of this drains back around the hill. Um, but okay. yes, it's there. There's water running down there today. This we sh should not be adding. If it's designed right, we should not be adding to it. Okay, so it mostly runs to the south and then back to the yeah. north. Takes a takes kind of a, a left yeah. around the hill. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? That there was more or. This will capture more water than what was captured last, was it spring? Listen, if you have a 500 year flood, it doesn't matter what you build. Yeah, no kidding. It's, it's not gonna make any difference. I mean, that's just- But right I'm now. just trying to say they're right. trying to address that. Right. We can't yeah. force yeah. anything I, I, right I, I, now, I but- I understand they're trying to address it, but I'm just saying, if you put a 36 inch culvert, I know the design's not done, along that blacktop road, underneath that driveway, I don't see how that, I mean, yeah, 36 that you'd have to get low enough so that you're not pushing more the 36 water. 36-inch culvert is going to go something like out there because this is the existing ditch, and it's a good-sized ditch. Uh, we'll have the berm here, here, and the existing one here, and it's got to be designed, but it will go directly into that ditch at the, the, the 36 10-year undeveloped level. So what's going to be underneath that driveway? I was just going to say, so the 36-inch isn't under the driveway. It's more at an angle well, going will, out. There will be another. There will have to be another pretty small pipe, but there will have to be one carrying water parallel to 30. Yes, degrees. and that's what he's asking, is if the 36 one was under the driveway, it's going to elevate the driveway in a way that will push water onto the other property. Right. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So, yeah, we're talking about two different areas. The dam and force the water back the other way, Alex, for the majority huh? of it. It'll actually be, a, if they elevate the driveway, it'll be a dam that forces the water to the south more than letting it go to the north. I don't know, I'm directionally. Well, north is to the top of the screen. The page. <clears throat> okay, and along the so road. That, which would affect the neighbor. Yeah, which is why well, we're saying there has to be. Not necessarily, it's not gonna be because you're building a natural dam with that driveway, so you're not gonna have much water. Okay. Well, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But that, that becomes a natural dam and forces a lot of that water to the south. Right, thank you. I don't know, Marcia. Thank you. It was a challenging lesson. I'm Edward Knapp, and I live at 2907 Alaska Street. And I think of anybody here, whatever they build back there is going to jeopardize me more than anybody because I'm the lowest spot there. But I want it to be known that he talked about water coming from just the, the, from the top of that hill. There's other water that comes from the north, and it all funnels down to that point. You have the other houses that are north of there, and roads north of there, and that water flows from there down to that point. They all meet at that point. Sir, could you step over there and point to that point too, please? Right here. Um, yeah, you can't do it. You need a mouse. Oh. It's right here at this point right here. Do I need a mouse, buddy? Brent can do it. 
Right there's the whole, right there's the whole point. We're That's the point right there. Yeah. But there's water that comes from the north from that to that point too. Once you settle the problem that comes from the top of the hill, you still got water coming from the north because there's houses up there and that's hillside up there and they all funnels down to that point. Even from the other direction, going back east from the hills there, it funnels back down to Alaska Street. Last year was a major event, but who's to say, who's to say it's not gonna happen in another three years? If you right. build a house down there at that valley, that's gotta be cut down to put that house in there. And when you do that, that house is gonna be setting right in the spillway. That new house will have troubles. It'll flood, no doubt. That berm, I was kind of light on the description as by how deep it was there. It was about 10 foot deep at that berm last year or last March. The water was? Yep, 10 foot of water in there. And it came over the top is because I'm the one that cut the hole as a relief to something to let the water out because it was running over the top and running down right through my yard. So, and then it came down across through my yard and it was still coming around on along West 30th Street. And all that water came down to Alaska and then the culprits that were there, the water started to back up because it couldn't handle it and it backed up and it backed up in the yard and that's when I got the flooding in my basement. Well, do you think it was plugged up or do you think it was just coming too yeah, fast? It was a combination of plugged up culverts and you know, I dig mine out about every spring, go down there and dig it out. Some people don't. But then you're getting water from the other direction. It all funnels to that point. It comes from every direction there. And that's it's just the way the contour is. That's the main relief getting down the military is right down through that valley from all sides. Well, Mr. Knapp, I think what we're trying our best to do here is to take this step by step and try to babysit it as best we can as a council. What I'm saying is it. you build there, you're gonna build a house that's probably gonna have flood damage some year, brand new house. You're gonna have a neighbor that's gonna get flooded. I'm gonna get flooded, three homes. And that's not to say the whole other houses they put in that area ain't gonna flood either because they gotta cut the hill down to put the houses in there. Understood. So you're gonna have some flat spots there. Understood. One thing about living out in the country or moving out there, you have more of everything. More water, more dirt, more wind, more leaves, more of everything. So That's the reason why that berm was that. built there. That was built there originally to protect that home. I got the oldest home in that area. That berm was put there to protect that home because they were having trouble with runoff coming down there because Virgil Clemenson talked about, before I moved there, that that house had six inches of water on the floor, on the main floor. They built that berm there to channel that water away and around the house and back down in front down Alaska Street is how they build it. It's worked most of the time, not all the time. So it didn't work in March. But again, the event we had last year, who's saying it ain't gonna happen three years? Right. It will happen again. We just It's just don't a know matter of not, but right. when. Right, That's exactly. the question. And you're gonna have new homes in there, they're gonna have damage. And you'll have the same thing you had over Morningside with the homes over there. You're gonna wind up tearing them down and moving them out. Thank you very much, I appreciate you coming in. Ren, at what point in the process does this design work come in? How soon does that take? It would come in when the houses are built. Um, you know, again, we're dealing with a minor subdivision, which normally doesn't have any improvements whatsoever. Um, we, uh, when, when uh, well, when building permits come in and we review it at that time, I'm pretty sure each and every one of these houses is gonna end up with 25,000 or more square feet of impervious area when you figure in the, the driveway and such. So at that time, when the building permit comes in, we will uh, uh, then, like we would with a McDonald's or whatever, make sure that there is a properly sized detention pond and a properly sized outlet, and if necessary, a properly sized way to get to it. So did you do the same type of design work on the, the other houses that are built? There now. So the, I mean, what, what the other ones on this on this subdivision. No, um, I've been this this corner, the north, the northerly two lots seems to have been the ones where the issues have been. So that's what we've been trying to work on. And again, I'm not designing anything. I'm a right. long way from a designer. I'm trying to make some guesstimates and uh, make some assumptions.
Well, and they have to clean out those pipes. That's not our responsibility. The other houses that, that were built previously, did they have the, did they have the same oh, yeah. design requirements? The uh, two houses water, that were built previously. On water flow? This one, owned by a guy named Rasmussen, which had been built, I think, in the 60s. And one right about there, which uh, they, were built prior, they were built prior to any design standards we have. So any new ones, we'll follow the design standards. We can't go back and deal with the old ones. When was Mr. Kleinsmith's house built? So, did he have to put any detention ponds on? I'm just asking if the city required it, if you did it. I'm asking that we required it. Um, unfortunately, I would doubt it. It was part, it was, it was a single family house and we, at that time we probably didn't. I'll have to check, I can send An individual lot or, uh, wouldn't be memo. required because it wouldn't meet the, the minimum in creation of impervious surface since they're creating four lots they're going to create enough impervious surface that they are over the threshold where we could permit a waiver i mean mr kleinschmidt built his own but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we require typically on a subdivision that the detention basin should be built for the entire subdivision not on an individual home by home basis uh, technically they can't even subdivide without a grading detention plan then, right? Because he keeps saying it's individual lots and I'm... I'm well, if, if they're doing a minor subdivision, by definition, we don't have any improvements, so there's nothing to base your runoff calculations on. And at this rate, we're going to have to build probably four separate ones because the topography just takes the water at that point. Um, so as a normal case, in, in a subdivision like this, which is a minor subdivision, we have no choice but to review the detention either as a house-by-house -house case or as a drainage area, and which in this case is pretty much the same thing. Uh, if John, uh, John Sulzbach, when he builds Wood, uh, Whispering Creek, yeah, at that time we can get, uh, get uh, estimate really well how much runoff we're gonna have, and they build it at that time. We have no way of estimating how much runoff we're going to have here until the guy builds the houses. And it won't be the developer. He's just selling lots. It'll be some future house. That's what concerns me. Right. That each person is going to end up being responsible, one of these six lots, for creating their own retention pond? Is that? That's, yes. Well, there's only going to be four new houses, but yes. At their own expense. Obviously. I was going to say, well, yes. and we, yeah. can we guarantee that they will, right? Right. Or not? Uh, we will not issue building permits uh, until that until that's on there, and and uh, no, they will build it when when the house gets built. Well, what about requiring the developer who's asking for the subdivision to do it? Do we have any authority to do that? That's probably Dave? something you need to ask for the ask the developer. <laughs> but, but again, he doesn't know. He's selling lots. He doesn't know how big the lot the house is. Well, I understand I'm, that. I'm, but I'm if gonna, I go on to a commercial development, it doesn't matter. I got to give you an idea of what I'm putting right. in there, and you got to you got to tell me the size of the detention pond, and I got to put that in before I begin to sell lots. We have that problem up north, and we're spending three hundred thousand dollars to correct a prior mistake. Right. Yeah, I would say it, the subdivision as a whole should have a plan that plan. captures all the runoff that comes from the lots because it's not just the impervious surface. Our detention standard is you take the 100-year storm post-developed down to the 10-year pre-developed runoff rate. And I don't see how they would capture each lot would be, you know, some of these lots you're showing the one on a ridge line. They'd have to have two detention basins because it goes. Both then we're going to have four different both. opinions down the road as to where it should be, how big it should be, what it's about. I and just think that the developer, before we give them a subdivision, should have to have the water plan. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but. <laughs> 
but I, I understand what you're saying. <coughs> right. The next item goes hand in hand. Right. Right. Question about passing. Trying not to have any surprise or problems. any problems with it. Yeah. No, that's where you'd make the motion to require it. So. All right. Anyone else? Not off the record. You, no. you have to come up here. You got, you got to come to the. You got to come to the microphone. No. Okay. Yep. You got to do it that way. I'm not against approving any area. It's a good idea. The only thing it has to be done right. The only way it can be done right that hill has to be terraced. It has to be terraced to slow the water down. Otherwise. You could put anything down there and you would think it would work, but that kind of water that can run down there and it comes from every direction like it does, if it gets plugged up, it's going to be a natural flood. You'll lose those homes in there, including mine. Is Thank your you. home on Alaska? I live on yeah. Alaska, 2907 <laughs> Alaska. Thank you. Yeah, Brad Wilson, 3725 Military Road. I'm the guy that created this problem, I guess. Uh, we have so, you to thank. Yeah. Had no idea that it was going to create all this. Um, the thing is, is without any idea who's going to build and where <clears> they're <throat> going to build, there's no way I can do a plan. I could spend a lot of money, and it would never be done the way it was because you got to know where the houses are going to go. One thing I don't think anybody's talked about is there's quite a bit of soak away on these properties. There's a lot of area there, a lot of grass. I mean, it doesn't, when it rains fast, it's going to run out, but I really don't see why it could be, it's so impossible for the city to take care of making sure that the drainage is right when you, somebody wants to build a home. If you build a home on a flat lot, it's really not a big deal, but when you have it on a hill, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. So uh, I just, I think that it could be done. I built a house in the hill. Uh, I'm back into the hill on North of Military Road, and I went in and put drain pipes and contoured the land and made it so it drained around the house. And I've been there 20 plus years now and not had a problem. So it's just a matter that you got to plan right and you got to you got to design it and control the water. And that's what anybody else that's going to live up in this part of the town is going to have to deal with or not not live there. It's not it's not a residential zone where you're nice flat lots so is that something I hope to take into consideration for this thank you, thank you. so what we can recommend the rezoning and then on the next one <coughs> make an amendment to require it would have to, I think the recommendation is if the plat is going to be considered today. Um, that second and third reading on the rezoning would need to be considered first. Prior to yeah, I don't think we want to be approving the plat without the rezoning or vice versa. Um, if that's what you want, uh, simply make it a requirement of the rezoning. Either way, we can get it on there. Right, they have to. You don't have an option. Say, say, uh, say, I didn't hear that. What? You bet you can't pass the plat till you pass the rezoning. It has to go step not, by step. No, that's not a good idea. Right. That wouldn't be. Not a good idea. I'm not even sure it's legal, but. Probably not, yeah. It doesn't stop me necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a lawsuit, so. <laughs> Item 12. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> How do we get the power? Pass is five zero. Anybody want to do third reading? Sure. 
I make a motion that we uh, waive the rules. First. Waive the rules. Waive the rules first, so that we can vote on on, on the waiving of the rules first, and <coughs> and followed by the waiving of the rules. And this is just so we can do the third reading of yes. the rezoning part, not of necessarily the yes. other stipulations. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Jayner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. We need to move third reading. I'll move third reading. Second. Yeah. Just kidding, buddy. <laughs> Voting electronically. Yes. Passes 5013's resolution approving the final plat of Dogwood Edition. Petitioners out, Fagan PNZ recommends approval deferred from January 27th, February 10th, 24th, and March 2nd. There's, is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, can we move, instead of deferring that to the next meeting, we'll never get that done by then. Could we have two meetings? Never get what done? Uh, get, the, get the, I assume we're going to want drainage issues shown. Well, I don't know that until we oh. get the, we got to put this on the floor first, right? Oh. If we, I mean, then, then it, if, <laughs> Time somebody, in. Then if right? somebody asks for an amendment, then, then you can request that. But we got to do this, I think, in this order. I guess we could, but without giving you direction, the only way to give directions through an amendment, I think. Would you agree? Correct. Um, for discussion, it would need to be moved and seconded. And there are three current recommendations, I believe, by staff, which are not, I don't know that there's been a revised plat that has been submitted at this point. So there would need to be a motion uh, directing that those items be included, which is the. Um, that can be part of the amendment besides. Correct, but there are three staff yeah. conditions. What are they? Inside. Um, the first one is requiring lot four of the proposed Dogwood addition to take access off the easterly 150 feet of West 30th, and then also requiring lot three of Dogwood addition to take access off a joint shared access point with either lot four or lot two to Military Road, and directing staff to develop a proper maintenance plan for streets in the area. Well, does that have anything to do then, or do we need to make a motion also then to require the drainage plan or looking into that? That would be in the, that would be in the sides, amendment. and you've also got to have a second, because I don't think anybody seconded the motion to 13, did they? Second. It? Yeah, who made it? Moved it? I didn't know anyone mo okay. moved it, yeah. Oh, I thought, okay, so we don't no, even have a motion We don't have second, a motion. So we've got to, let's get that in play first, if you want to, otherwise you can... I guess you can direct staff to get that and other stuff and defer this for a while. I don't know what's the best way to do it, whether we defer it now or just we make the motion, do the additions and defer that. If, to have it discussed on the floor, I would suggest moving yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So I'll make a motion. <laughs> right. I'll make a motion. That's what I'm trying to do, but I'm losing control today. <laughs> All right, I'll <laughs> yes, item 13. of with item the, 13. With the three staff recommendations. Staff recommendations. Are you including the three staff? Yes. Yes. In your motion. Yes. That's included in the motion because it came to us that way. Or is that we're all assuming that? I'll second that one. Okay. Now, is there an amendment to regard to the water plan? I move that we add an amendment so that the developer would have to provide a water plan. Acceptable to the city engineering. Now I would, I guess, ask Jeff the question if he wishes to have a deferral so the plat can be redrawn to show these restrictions or I guess how you would like to have that addressed at this point. You need point. a second on the motion. To yes. Amend, though. Correct. Second. Jeff Hansen, Community Development Operations Manager. I would recommend that that plan be created and approved by engineering before the plat is approved. That way, both city engineering and the developer are aware of what's going to be required. If we just approve the plat and cannot come to an agreement on what is required for stormwater, uh, then we have a plat out there that cannot be built on. So I would suggest working with the developer, and maybe we can have Mr. Wilson come up here 
uh, and provide us a timetable on what he thinks is reasonable to provide that stormwater plan. I'd like to see them present it to the city instead of the city doing the work. Exactly, right. that's how it would be. Yeah, that's okay. how it has to work. All right. So do you understand what's being asked of you? Yeah, of just what the timeline you would like. I don't have any idea what, how I would do this. So I have no idea what the cost is and, um, or what we're actually planning because there's no, there's no development gonna happen here. We get these lots split, when somebody buys it, they'll be the developer, I won't be the developer. I don't see a problem with having the developer do the drain and if you want to put it on this, how we would do this to record it so that anyone buying the property would know that they have to have a drainage plan to put a house on it. But until you put the house on, I don't know how you do a plan and I think it would just, it'd be a waste of money to do it. Because it could be a lot more concrete or a lot less. I mean, so I understand. Have no idea what they want to do, where they, they may put how big a house they're going to put or what kind of driveway arrangement they would decide to do. So to his point then, is there, we can set up this or pass this with those stipulations and then as soon as someone pulls a building permit to actually build on those different lots, then you can require that? Well, I think oh. what Dave was mentioning earlier is that that stormwater plan could be developed based on the acreage of each lot because they have to collect the stormwater off the entire site. And so I think there is some planning that can be done to show, hey, this pond on each lot ranges from this size to that size and the location where it needs to be. I think that's kind of what you're asking for with some assurance that the stormwater can be handled. And so maybe it's not a full stormwater design, stormwater plan, but at least some understanding that this six, six acre lot has to retain this much water in this location. Sure. That gives us some better ideas of if it can be managed. I mean, every subdivision that's done, they estimate the size of the homes and yeah. driveways and right. all that. So they would have to provide that, what they're estimating, what the size of the roof area and driveways and all that would be. So then I guess to his point, he's just uncertain how to go about that. So as long as cities, if, as long as we could point him in the direction of who, what firms we would recommend or- We don't we, recommend any firms. He, he gets just has to search them. Here, yeah. Does that make sense then? You would be able to- No, sounds like it may not be able to do the, do the project, I guess, because I, it's again, this is large, large lots. I don't, if you want to have a, a retention for the lot by itself, would be one thing, but otherwise, I, I just, I guess, I'm not going to be able to divide it this way. But I guess that's what I would assume. I would assume if I have a seven acre lot, then I'm going to have seven acres. My risk would be that seven acres, that much water will be going into that pond, and if it's two acres, then that's their share of the water. So whether they put a 1,000 square foot house or a 20,000 square foot house, they still have water. Well, it could be. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 when you have an engineer do it, yeah. But I don't know that I'm gonna be able to cover the cost of all of this. I've already got quite a bit invested in this and I'm not sure what it even costs to do this, so. Well, that would And that's where you could get those estimates, spider. you know what I mean? Could you, could you cover it with a, a more of a blanket Approximate, and you're talking about an approximation anyway of what could be built. Could you do it with a, a, a requirement that that storm water be provided for, even though you have to do that when you get the building permit? Can you still tie that in with the, with the platting process? Yeah, I think there's a way to do that. We could work with Mr. Wilson and our engineering staff and, and um, potentially an engineer that will be hired by the property owner. Um, what I would suggest is another deferral on this so we can sit down with Mr. Wilson and kind of go through exactly what we expect that we'll need for the stormwater and allow Mr. Wilson the opportunity to make a decision if he wants to proceed forward. I think there's something in between. I think your point's well taken. I think mm -hmm. everyone that spoke today, their points are well taken, but I think there's something in between because you don't know what's going to be built on these lots. But, and yeah. you don't want to cost you too but much. But yet we want to protect the surrounding area and you, haven't, you don't have any objection to having a stormwater plan, but it can't be real specific at, well, this, at yeah. this point in time. And if, I don't, if we don't move forward with this, it, the land's going to stay the, exactly the way it is right now and nothing's going to change. Yeah. So that's the other side of this. It'll just sit there. It's been that way for 
many, many years, and I've only owned it for a short period of time. So. Correct. How well, long have you owned it, sir? Two years. Two years. And well, do you we, have some people who are interested, like waiting nope. for us to hurry up and? I'm not offered anything because I didn't know I, until I have something done, I can't offer anything. Okay, good. I what, just want to uh, ensure that someone who hasn't breathing down your neck, you know, waiting. No, just okay. We're just trying to get one step at a time. Sure. You need okay, two weeks. More I would than recommend that. two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, I'll move to defer item 13 for two weeks to and amendments. Uh, and amendments to um, March 23rd. Second. Jayner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Gretkin. Aye. Moore. Aye. 14 is a hearing and resolution approving plans and specs for the heritage parking ramp repair project. <coughs> I'll move that. Thank you. Second. Second. Hearing is now open. Would anyone like to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Ms. Shainer. Thank you. Passes 5 0. 15 is a hearing and resolution approving the sale of part of vacated West Street. Petitioners Mark Baker. I'll move that. Second. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5 0. 16 is a resolution approving and consulting services agreement with Hunt. Hunden Strategic Partners for the Redevelopment of the Badgerill Building. We want to move that. I'd like to have discussion on that. If you got to move it first. Yeah. Oh. First, yeah. I move for discussion. Is there a second? Second. Mayor and Council, um, we've uh, we've talked about this a couple times before, but I, th I think we need to uh, cover it and discuss and get your direction on this. So um, we are recommending this process uh, to hire um, hunting consultants uh, for several reasons. Um, first of all, um, we think the Badger building itself is of a great deal of importance to downtown. Um, it's an iconic historic building, 12 stories, but un unfortunately it's vacant right now, but we think it's a great opportunity to be part of the, the turnaround and, and, and renovation of downtown itself. Um, Following this process, we believe we'll generate more as much interest as we can in the in the in the building. Um, get get developers from different areas uh, interested in it, excited about it. Yes, we have been contacted by a number of them already, but we think our best result will be from getting as much interest as we can. Um, also, we think we'll, we we will likely get. Um, better quality proposals. Obviously, there's going to be a negotiation, including what role the city will do, what participation the city will have. And we think by going through this process, we'll get them to sharpen their pencils a little bit and, and, and be, have a, a little competition introduced into the process. Um, and and um, in addition, this is a fairly complex uh, project, as you know. We, we um, uh, lost a little time, a couple months, actually, because of some of that. But, but basically, because of the historic tax credits and the master lease that's involved, it's going to require a developer with some expertise and understanding of the historic tax credit process. Um, so um, for all of those reasons, we think it's a good idea to have the uh, Hunden assist us with this. Uh, we've worked with them before. They have a good track record um, in our, and have been involved in a lot of projects around the country. So. Um, Th that's why we think that um, this would be a good idea to proceed with bringing them in and assisting us with it with essentially a, an RFP process. A larger firm is Hunden. I don't. I'm not sure how many employees they have. Um, uh, the, the team that we seem to work with, they've got a number of people on board. I think five or six people that I talk to about this project, but uh, I'm not sure what their total number is. Maybe it's in that information. Not for you, Marty, this is a, uh, could be a 90-day process. We talked a little bit about that previously. Sure. Um, 
what what they proposed was a 90-day process, kind of a sort of a two-part process. The first part we initially thought might be kind of an RFQ, but after working with legal on that, we whoever is involved in presenting uh, in asking for information or presenting information, we have to allow under Iowa law have to allow to be provide an RFP. So the first part would be essentially a solicitation process, a marketing process to to get as much interest as we can. Uh, provide developers with information, and then um, following that, then we would have a probably four to five week RFP process where we would take a, a formal process to take RFPs and then be uh, likely be some actual interviews, tours of the building, um, and they would submit a formal proposal, which then would be evaluated, but then that still has to go through the council in, a two, in the two-step process of bringing a 30-day notice, as you know, anytime we're selling property, in an urban renewal area, there has to be a 30-day notice. So it, it's a, we think it's about a 90-day process for that, plus probably um, 30 to 60 additional days, in all honesty, to by the time you get it negotiated and to the point where the council can vote on a proposal and then give that 30 days for the final vote on that. So um, one of the things I know that's th that we discussed and the mayor and Dan discussed earlier today at a meeting um, is, you know, we're one of the components of a, of a successful project here is very likely to be state and federal historic tax credits. Kind of a limitation in Iowa on state credits is, is there's a limited, there's a cap on the amount of money that's available and there's a process you have to follow. And in this year, in Iowa, last year was only one date, this year in Iowa there's two, uh, April and October. They haven't set the actual date yet, but in all li likelihood, it's, it's too too uh, late in the game now for April, but there may be a possibility that a developer could could um, uh, apply for the October deadline. Um, but it's seven months out. If this is this, this is you know there's a there's, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but there's two parts to that. The second part of that is getting your plan approved by the state by SHPO. And so um, that can take a while. So there is kind of an unknown there. There's a possibility that they would not make the October deadline. If that's the case, then, you're, then they would be applying for the spring. And, and I, again, I, I think the capital it's gonna to take to do this project, to say it's 20 million or so, is gonna require federal and state tax credits, historic tax credits. So, so that process will play into that. And um, there's kind of a little bit of a trade-off here. Obviously, the faster we can move, the better chance they would have of maybe getting in, in, in this year, in 2020, in October. But the faster we go, we may not get as good a, a, a chance to vet all the proposals and to get the best possible negotiated deal. So, so that's kind of a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, you know, we originally thought we were going to start last December. And as you know, we had some things that had to be worked through on the legal side, which didn't really involve the city, but just delayed the project. So sitting here now in March, it's a little tight for that. We may be able to make it, but um, here, here's you know, my, may not. Well, I understand, and here's my thinking, Marty, because I think we all acknowledge and can embrace that there's a high degree of interest in the, in the building mm -hmm. by various developers. I think, it, I think there's a lot of that that's already in place. And after we discussed this a little bit, after I looked at the proposal again, and I'm wondering if the, if Hunden would not be willing to and would accept instead of 90 days, 60 days, because you're really looking at, it says manage and execute a full developer solicitation and selection process. And so the earlier we can complete that, you're right, there are going to be timelines that will be uncontrollable by us, but time is of the essence to select that developer. Why couldn't we move that up at least 60 days instead of the 90? maybe even shorter, but with, with that in mind, because there has been a lot of interest mm -hmm. um, since we started approaching this whole topic. Okay. I'm asking if we could go to 60 days and see if they would be willing to work within that time frame. I, I have not asked them that. I, I, know, I know they probably won't recommend that, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't do it if we, if we asked, asked that. But um, if we want, I, I don't, you know, they're, they're they have other projects, and I don't know what their schedule's like, but it's possible that they could. They see, they, when I talked to them last week, they said they were ready to go. And assuming you passed, passed this tonight, we were going to start tomorrow morning, <coughs> the call to them tomorrow morning. So, but I, I, I'm not sure if they would or not. But um, I mean, the reality is would be in the process anyway. Even with 60 days, would be in the process. So if, if they can't work within that time frame, in all likelihood, Mayor, they'd probably have to come back and say, 
we need another 30 days. We would hope that wouldn't happen, but at least we've defined it to 60 days, which, it, which would make it a little, a little better. I mean, you're right. You've, you've outlined some timelines, though, that, that are going to be way out there, but it just seems if we could yeah. shorten that period. And I, and I don't, you know, I, I hesitate to, to I mean, there are other things that may take more time as well. I, for example, this is very likely to be a mixed use project with some residential in it. Um, developers in, in Iowa are going to want to apply for the Iowa Workforce Housing Program. Many, many projects have already gotten that, those benefits in Sioux City. Um, but they're not available right now. So unless the legislature adds some money to that program, uh, and there's been discussion, but I haven't seen any bills yet. <laughs> uh, it'll come at you know at the end when the, the finance uh, the, the finance bills go tax bills go through. But but um, that we could make up time on the historic credits and still not be able to move forward because of of, of workforce housing credits. I, it just depends on the approach the developer takes to it, what their other financing sources are, and so on. So but won't we have? Maybe I'm not understanding fully the process. Will Will we not have the developers selected, though, way before all of that? Or are they going to make all of their, the developers, are they going to come in and make all of their proposals subject to A through Z happening? How would you then select that developer you, by right. just saying, well, so, you've got so many subject well, or contingencies? N no, I was just, I just wanted to have a caveat about the timing. I, I just, I, I think, oh, no, yes, I we would have that. the, yeah. we would have an agreement and it's up to them to go seek those sources. But a lot of the, uh, whether it, historic tax credits or workforce housing credits, they're going to, they're eligible for them. They'll get them eventually. If you look at some of these buildings, like the it's Commerce Project or whatever, it just takes longer when there's caps. So, and it depends on how many applications there are in any given year. So the project will get done, they will get those credits, but it just may not be as fast as we hope. But I'm just looking for the selection of the developer. And, and I think I can help with that a little okay. bit, Dan. Okay, Thanks. because this is an urban renewal project, we have to do, we don't know who our select developer will be. So essentially it's a three-step process. You initiate it with the council, we establish the criteria and how we're going to evaluate and measure developers and who will ultimately bring forward indicating that a developer has been chosen by staff or by the recommendation for Hunden to present to the council. Um, and then that will be an additional 30-day time period beyond that for additional uh, developers to put essentially a bid in for the ultimate selection. They could compete against each other. So because we have to set that criteria at the at the very least that's a 60-day process just for the council timeline and probably several weeks longer than that irrespective yeah, the council, of the unfortunately for or fortunately probably fortunately has very little to say about this process it's going to be marty and hunden that are going to do it well, well i mean you're telling me it's part of my process but it's it's not part of my process and we can make it more so for the council because ultimately when the council has to pass a resolution announcing its intent to accept a developer 30 days from the date. Well, I know that understand enough. that part, but I'm talking the criteria to even determine what a developer, what this building should be. Sure. And, and that's something that Hendon and staff and the council, I think, should assist with and establish. I was going to say, but would we that can be your committee, the economic development committee, you and Dan? <laughs> or no well well i'm not sure as for because you're talking now about the purpose how are you going to what's the purpose of the building or what's the youth proposed use going to be of the building mm -hmm. and who's to determine that other than the developer who wants to come in how do you know there's going to be housing units on the upper floors commercial right because every developer right. has a different I, vision yeah they, they might they have may. a different concept of that right uh, we could I'm have the that, council approve the rfp my whole right? point is the Staff has a lot more to do with that than you and I are going to have. If we it's established like, by criteria like in the resolution. Today. This didn't get run by our committee. We got it on our agenda today, just like you're getting it here. We had it two hours ago, but oh we didn't gosh. talk about this on that committee. It, Whether got, or not oh, to approve. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and I, no, that's what I was asking, yeah. was if it goes before you guys first or anything. The council has to pass a res resolution establishing the criteria. Um, it has to come through the council, and I know I understand what the mayor is saying. And I don't, in the past, we have tried to be not as specific as determining which floors would be a mixed use or anything. No, I don't like that. think that's the case at all. Yeah. 
I it would be I it would be broader than. And that. I'm not saying we should have more input. I'm just saying, don't let the public believe that we have a lot of input in this because we don't. That's all I'm saying. So. Are we voting now, though, whether or not to hire Hunden? Yes. That's what's before us. My question is, if we don't hire Hunden, who does the burden of their work fall on? On staff. On economic on staff. development. On economic mm -hmm. development. And are you prepared to take that on if we don't approve it? Yes, of course. And I, I mean that's our. I, I have faith that we can do this. Honestly, who so, knows better than what we want? Again, then? I, I, I the, uh, the judgment here that we're making is that this would be helpful to the that we would get better proposals and and maybe generate and generate more interest. Now we we can do that. We do that all the time with with all all kinds of projects. So right. Um, Right, I'm not, I, I will and, will get the job done. I, mm -hmm. I can tell you that. It's just I, I'm, the re thought that we have and the recommendation that we have and that I have from Bob is is to is to propose this, and we think this would be helpful. And in the long run, this is a high value, high dollar, major major project, and so this is an expense to consider. I don't disagree with that. I just I think that in the long run, will will benefit from having a you know top flight development project here that will help Sioux City in the long run. Um, but I mean, I guess that's the, the decision before you. But that um, we if if not, we'll get started tomorrow. I asked the on same a separate a different type of RFP. I asked a similar question, to Mr. Padmore, and it puts you in an awkward spot because you're going to say yes, we'll take it on, and yes, we'll do it to the best of our ability. Sure. Mr. Padmore's position was. This would help the process. This would this would get us a more quality, qualified developer. There are a lot of moving pieces to it. Um, the mayor probably has the best handle on all of the moving pieces. I think I probably have a pretty good idea of all of the moving pieces. So it's no judgment on your staff, no, Marty, absolutely. or on the economic development department, but it's how can we get how can we get the best product because we're going to be in it's in downtown. It's a historic building. It's a significant building. And we want to make sure. I mean, we heard earlier tonight, the citizens want, they just want it done right. Just please do it right. And I think that's why it's before us. The time frame, the time it's going to take, and it's no fault of yours again, but the, but the 90 days just seems long to go through the selection process. And I understand what the city attorney outlined. I get all that, but I'm just talking about getting the process started and, and moving a little quicker than the 90 days. That's what I was trying to push for, Julie, and I, I, but I asked a similar question. That was all, that was on my mind as well. Like, well, why don't we just do this? But I think it's, it might be bigger than, <clears throat> it might be big, bigger than what uh, we might realize. Well, and I think just with all due respect on that, I'm not, I don't want to offend anybody in this. No, no, no. You might and just I, do a and great job. Okay. I, I don't want you to feel like I, think that you're, you know, transferring your workload somewhere else. I'm not. I just, I have confidence in we'll our be, staff as well. We'll be very involved in the process either way. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, um, they would be providing us with the assistant and oversight of the, of the RFP process. But obviously, there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of steps that have to take place before it's ready to be, um, you know, begin the development, the, the construction. And, and that's going to include um, the finding the right developer, but then also negotiating a, a development agreement and a minimum assessment agreement. And, and all of those things need to be approved by council. And uh, we will certainly look to council for direction as to how this, what type of project you want to see ultimately in the end, because this is too important to downtown Sioux City and to, to the future of, of the of the city to not to not be talking to you about you know what we want what you want to see in the end uh, that's that's critical. Nicole, how do we build that in then, so that the council can have more input? Well, if that assists on this, it would be two council members, um, whether it's the economic development um, members or a different two that would be appointed to assist staff with. Um, Additionally, there could be presentations made to the council for direction as well. So, Marty, are you, do you have an idea exactly what the criteria is that, that you want from a prospective developer? I mean, do you have one, two, three, four? Well, 
I, I could, sure, but I think that's not my de that's a, oh, okay. it's a decision that the, the city council needs to make and the city manager and, and, and we'll get advice from the, from, the, from the consultant if that's the way we go. And the developers themselves are going to look at, they're exactly. going to do their own studies and they're going to look at what they think the market, and what the market, the market needs. So. so then we uh, vote to uh, move forward with uh, Hunden. And then we will have a meeting that we can offer input or determine what we sure. expect from them throughout the process. It's already in their contract. Sure. We're going to go by their contract. You can make recommendations or you can look at it and, and that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be what that developer wants. And you have to decide then. You'll get three or four proposals and you can look at them and then maybe one even though it doesn't look like it's the best deal for the city as far as financially goes but it might be the best deal for the city 20 years of financial to go yeah. i mean and then you'll have to weigh all that stuff out yeah i i understand that they'll have to present right um options but but i understood i'm just going to go back to the hunden deal on the <coughs> and listen i don't i'm not this is not being critical of marty i'm not sure that as complicated as this probably is that this, that his staff is set up to do it the way it needs to be done and I don't mean that derogatory at all either but but I, what I'm just and I'm not going to be bashful about it. I'm not a Hunden fan sorry they brought us one hotel promised us five or six they brought us one hotel that basically Dan if you remember they found us Hunden didn't find them right. so that's my concern is that they they oversold and under-delivered the last time, but I hope I'm wrong this time. I hope it actually works out really well. Well, you know what? Here, here's the may maybe. Maybe this is a missing piece, and Marty, maybe we need to, the council and the mayor, we need to direct you to give us, I don't think, weekly reports or weekly updates to the council. We could do it in an open forum, but weekly updates would probably play an important part of the significant... You should uh, do it on an economic de development memo. You do not need that because there's too many there's too much out well, then there. how about monthly just a monthly but, but but you can do that on a the memo development yeah exactly. because this is this okay is but I'm, I'm just trying to get that right. piece the the link between hunden marty's team and the council how do we link that up if you want to do a memo to the economic development team well just on those weekly updates that you sent yeah those normal weekly. economic development <laughs> yeah the weekly yeah. memo could, could you do that I, weekly absolutely do that weekly yeah we will do that and then if you need to get us, if you need to get our input on something, then of course we have to do it in an open meeting, open session sure. at that time. I think we'll have milestones along the way that we can talk about and we'll otherwise keep you updated on a weekly basis. This, this is a big, it's a big undertaking, a big project, and we take it very seriously and I think you should be involved as much as we can. And, and give us your direction. I mean, I, that's why we're here. <laughs> and, there, and there are so many others to have involvement in addition to the economic development team in the city. We have downtown partners, and we have, we have a whole host of uh, investors in downtown that will want to, you know, want to have some input on this. I mean, not only when we get to our public meet hearings and I'll, I'll and throw meetings. one. I'll throw another one at you. This is going to affect the parking system too, because the parking ramp there the parking is. Parking system. They, and we'll this have this to building address. has no separate parking lot, so they're going to have to use the ramps. And there are, you know, and that got, ramp the, the ramp already, across the street is is yeah. a great ramp, and it but it's pretty full. So we've got to figure that out. I think that's a challenge that we have here. I let's, agree, let's and that's that. where I agree, and that's where I think developers will come and say. Yeah, we really want to do this project, but you're going to have to provide X, or you're going to have to invest in X, or this is what it's going to look like, and we'll have to look at what we're able to do and where we're able to do it. I think weigh that thing. I think for me personally, and I've heard from constituents that they're and citizens in this community that their concern is getting the return on investment of sixty thousand dollars. You know, if we're going to invest in a in an organization that hopefully will get us across that finish line to the tune of sixty thousand dollars. We want to make sure that we get good return on that value. And I think that's where their concern is, and that's where you're hearing the council just say, we want to, we understand the nuances, some of the complexities of this type of a contract, um, but we just want to make sure that it's worth that investment. So at what point does the council provide? I st I'm still lost. Uh, any um, 
I think you can sit down with Marty and it's staff individually. I don't think it has to be. As the Economic Development Committee said, this is what we'd like to see in the developer. This is what we'd like to have them provide. Yeah, yeah but at some point we need to, though, don't we? And but we, your point is well taken with downtown partners and other investors. We would like to have the council members do that too individually. If you have something that you see in a in a weekly report, just mm, sit down with they Marty. Need follow up. Yeah, <laughs> just follow up with him and give him your ideas. And and talk to people out in the community. I think it'd be a, I think it'd be a good thing. Well, and my thing too is I. I I've been on many committees where you have too many cooks in the kitchen and everyone has an opinion. And then you have developers that are like, well, I'm gonna put up real money and, and this is what I think I'm gonna do. You know what I mean? No matter our opinion, we are gonna have to really look at what the market and what these developers are interested in producing and what they think the market will hold, where they can get the return on their investment. So I mean, but yeah, I agree that if we can get it in the council memo, and then if us indivi if each individual wants to follow up, I think that, that we're more than able to reach out to your office. To Dan's point, I mean, right now, because there's a lot to do, but right now I I'm looking at a a vehicle we can use to keep the project moving, timely, efficiently, and and get some results not wait the 90 days and see where we are, but be part of, as the mayor said earlier, to be part of the process, and that would be working closely with Marty and getting, getting information from you from time to time. Let's vote. Does anyone speak on it? Anyone want to be heard on this item? Yep, come on up, state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Jose Loera, 808 West 7th Street, Sioux City, Iowa. I wasn't going to say anything, but I just have a couple of questions on this project, on the building. Um, you asked that this, this, is a, this building is owned by the public now, right? By the city. Yeah, uh, yes. And you said, there was a comment here that it says that the people want something, uh, to, something to be done with, the, uh, with this building. Uh, but... How do you know that? Did you ask people around, people going around, hey, we want to do something with this building, et cetera, et cetera? How do you know that? How do, how do you know that people care? Some people just walk in that building and say, ooh, it's a nice building, or eh, whatever. How do you know people what, what they want? You go out asking, and also by input, and if now that we got the building, is it a project that, that we're going to have the building for us and sell it to someone to make some profit of it, or what's the... Say so it's a vision. They all said each person has their own vision. Developers have their own vision. Everyone. What is the purpose, so, or what is the city, or is the city going to ask? And the city doesn't really know. Like you, they said they don't know anything. Right. And the people are working on this project. They have a vision for this building. Are they going to ask the public, "Hey, what should we do with this building now? We well, got it. How can we make some profit off of it? How we turn our investment? Mm -hmm. What would be done? Condominiums." Uh, bringing in offices, et cetera. What's the best plan to do something? Those like are, that? Just the questions. Those are all good questions. Um, and I mean, I guess I've, we, we talk with, with people, sure. We talk with downtown partners. We talk with investors and developers. But mostly I talk with these folks because I work for them. <laughs> and it's their direction they want to set for the downtown and for, for historic preservation. We have some general goals that we have in mind. Uh, saving these older buildings. You look at the Warrior Project right now where you had a building that was vacant for 40, almost 40 years. It's now a 70, 80 million dollar project that's, that's put a lot of people to work and it's going to be a great asset for our downtown. So we've, we've kind of set a general direction to, to take these historic buildings that have outlived their usefulness in a lot of ways as office buildings or maybe what they were for a long time. But if you look at some other communities like Omaha or Des Moines or other places, and we're seeing it here, is they're returning to life as mixed-use buildings. So, you, so people want to live more and more in, the, in downtown areas, and, and they make uh, um, great uh, bringing population into the downtown. Um, in downtown Des Moines, they now have over 10,000 people living there. 
Um, we're not, probably not going to reach that level, but, but getting more people living downtown and working downtown, then that helps all the other businesses, the restaurants and bars, and, 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 and also um, brings people into a working environment where you're working and living in the same area. So that's kind of been a trend around the country. Um, obviously, I take my direction from these guys, yeah. and, and, but uh, we want to increase our tax base. We want to, these build, this building's been vacant for a, way too long, and it's a, it's a great building. It's in good physical shape, but it, it needs some reinvestment. So it's going to take something like probably $20 million or so to bring it back up to full usefulness. And um, so, but of course, it, we, we just went through this whole planning process, and we've got input from people on that as to what they want to see in the downtown area. But I think generally that's what we've heard is people like to see these older buildings put back to use, put back on the tax roll, and be used for housing and for offices and, and commercial space. So is that uh, that answers your question, but kind yes, of it does, and I don't have nothing against it. It's just talk about you know sometimes we the public want to know, or sometimes some of us want to maybe give an input or just say hey, absolutely, just kind of find out. And yeah, it's a good question. Well, I, that's I, that's really my question. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Welcome. Bye. Anyone else? <laughs> you can ask the question though. Marty, what makes you confident in uh, this company? The mayor brings up his concerns. I just wonder if they have a track record of producing in other communities or what makes you confident in this company? Sure, um, and I have to choose my words carefully because I know the mayor doesn't agree with <laughs> everything, but well, um, we found them. I mean, you want. I, I was going to say, I just want you to make no, that I'm, case. I'm that saying that come to the we worked with them. We don't agree. That's not a big We don't deal. agree necessarily, but we, um, we worked with them on the convention center project. And it eventually led to Kinseth um, uh, building a hotel and, and taking over the management of the convention center, which I think is going pretty well. Uh, but um, I've also had an opportunity to, to talk with Rob Hunden on many occasions. He's, I've seen uh, a lot of his presentations. Um, we actually had him come here and talk to the PDI conference we had here last year. And I've seen him, and I think Bob Padmore had seen him and, uh, at a conference he was at and talked to him at some length. And I've talked to a lot of his staff over the last you know, year or so. So uh, I, I, I think they have a good understanding of, of what it takes to to uh, get interest on a project like this and run an R they've run a lot of RFP processes, uh, dozens and dozens of them. You can look at their materials. So I think- Well, and that's what I'm asking. My is. impression is they're fairly, ex very experienced and have been in this, this area, this type of development for a long time and are respected, are respected uh, in that role. So um, I guess that's why we recommend them. With most of this taking place before I was elected, were there numerous companies such as these bidding the project or? Or for consulting? Yes. Um, no, we did not go out and seek a lot of that. It was somebody that when talking with the city managers, he thought he'd talk to them and he thought maybe we should see if they would step in and play a role in this. Um, I have had other companies call from time to time, but um, we didn't do it an RFP or anything oh, okay. like that. After this discussion, one way or the other, however, whatever you decide, we're, we're going to, I promise you, we will keep you updated and involved in the RFP criteria and also throughout the selection process and, and keep you updated on, on the steps that we're taking. Marty, if we did not support this, and it's not because we don't think we need to have a consultant, but we should solicit other consultants, what does that process look like? Because then maybe you're alleviating some of the mayor's fears. Oh, if you if you did an RFP for a consultant, yeah, um, well, you know what I mean. If others yeah. have contacted you, if the mayor thinks there might be other individuals, I mean, I just want to address as many people's concerns as possible, right? Well, I I think it would cause a lot of additional time to be taken on. Um, yeah, could do that if you directed us, but that's I think that would take another whole whole another weeks of time that we probably would better use even further to move forward.
Passes four to zero, or four to one, I vote no. Approving uh, or library strategic plan. Hi, Helen. Good evening, I'm Helen Rigdon, <clears throat> excuse me, library director. I was just gonna kind of give a brief uh, overview of our uh, strategic plan. Just a second here, let me get this going. Uh, we kind of started this process. It's part of our accreditation through the state library. We have to have a strategic plan. So <clears throat> we started working on this last year. And this is kind of what we came up with. This is how we did the process. When I got here, I started meeting with staff and was discussing areas that they felt needed improvement. Um, and then also when I would talk to patrons. We research library trends, what's coming. There's always, you know, a lot of new stuff out there, but um, we're trying to keep it on the uh, even keel on our budget. But we wanted to see what we could do maybe to offer to our patrons. We also studied the demographics for the Sioux City area to see places and the people that we are not reaching. Um, we, you know, we do know that we need to do an audit of our collection because we are, um, deficit in some of our uh, world languages that people have. Um, and then we conducted a patron survey in June 2019. Uh, we had almost 600 responses to that survey. We were really surprised. And so we took the, the, what they gave us. And then the staff and then the Board of Trustees had a retreat and we identified six areas of focus in our new mission statement. So this is what they came up with, um, providing equal access to quality resources for personal empowerment and community enrichment. We feel like this speaks to what the libraries wants to do in the community and uh, what we want to provide for our, our citizens. Our first focus area we found is literacy and communication. Of course, literacy is kind of the, the cornerstone, I guess, of the library world. But, um, you know, we want to foster a love and a sense of value for literacy in the communi uh, communi communi community, excuse me. But our communication, that's one area we think libraries kind of lack in. We know what all we offer, but we're not good at blowing our own horn. So we're going to come up with a kind of a, a communications plan and a marketing plan to get the word out there. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know you did that. So, yeah, it's always new. Our second focus area is inclusion. Um, we want to stress the importance of including and welcoming all members of our community. We do feel like sometimes that, you know, there are certain sections that we may, you know, not intentionally exclude, but we want to try and include everybody. Um, access, we want to make sure that all citizens have access to both our virtual and our physical library. Partnerships, this is something that we've been working on and we're gonna to continue to increase our partnerships with different uh, community uh, organizations and groups. We already are doing um, mindful movement. We are uh, partnering with one of the local yoga studios. They come in and we do it at noon. We are with the, uh, is it Connection for Area Agency on Aging? They're coming in and doing a monthly presentation. So we're doing a lot more of that, but we want to continue to en enhance and strengthen those partnerships. Um, technology, we all know that technology is coming and going and there's a lot, but we wanted to make sure we're meeting the need of um, our citizens. There are still so many people without access to computers and Wi-Fi and so we want to be sure to do what we're doing but also inter in introduce creative technology. And then staffing. We want to ensure that we have an adequate level of staffing and that we have them where we need them to maybe do some sh shifting around. So that's our six areas uh, of focus that we're looking at. And then we kind of put together a, an action plan. And I think you guys had one page of it maybe attached. And what it does, it's kind of a guideline that I'll take to the board and it tells what we're going to cover in each of the focus areas or what we're going to try to accomplish in these three years. Like under literacy and communications, we want to look at our collection development. We want to make sure that it's up to date. We want to explore maybe offering a library of things uh, to, for people to circulate. 
and of course early literacy and then complete our um, communications plan. Now the, our action plan is more kind of a living document if something would come up or drop on or off. Um, inclusion, we want to increase our adult programming. That is one area that was really noticeable that we were lacking in and we have stepped it up but we want to continue to offer technology classes and maybe some online privacy literacy for students and for adults. Um, we want to build a strong multilingual collection. So we are working on that in our collection development. We want to create a welcoming environment for all our users. We want to do a survey. Well, we're going to do a survey we're planning with our homeschoolers and then see what service we can offer to them as well. Um, and explore ideas to better serve day groups and then offer mini, mini tours for our new li uh, library patrons. Under access, we want to look at exploring some delivery and um, alternate hours maybe. We'd like to maybe expand back to Thursday night being open downtown, maybe have an open night at Morningside or open evening. Um, but also there are some other things we could do. Um, explore 24-7 library access, maybe like with a big kind of like a red box, only bigger, and we would put it like in maybe up north in Leeds or something that would, where people could go with their card, check out a book, pick up their holds, and they wouldn't have to come downtown, and it's just another alternate means um, that we don't have to have people. Some of this um, we would fund with, uh, we would ask for some funding from our friends and foundation to support some of this as we move along. Um, we want to, of course, enhance our, our signage, um, we want to improve our online patron engagement. Um, one thing we find that's a barrier to library services for some people are overdue fines. And that's kind of a movement right now in the library world is eliminating overdue fines. And so that's something we want to explore. We know that's a source of revenue for the library, but we are looking at some other alternate ways to maybe uh, bring in some other money. So that's some stuff that we're going to look at. Um, one thing down here, downtown, we would like to get rid of the double desk model we have on our main floor. If you walk in, you have circulation, you have information. We'd like to combine it in one big desk and provide so people aren't getting shuffled from desk to desks. So we're going to look at that. Technology, um, we are thinking about maybe a memory lab where people can take like their DVDs well, they're VHS tapes and record them onto DVDs. Um, that would be with equipment. Uh, we'd probably have that at the morning side. Um, we are looking at new ILS, we're in the, uh, which is our integrated library system. Currently, we use Horizon, and they've had that for over 20 years. So they've, uh, we're upgrading that, and that will go live in April. Um, let's see what else. Uh, staff, or we're going to look at our staffing model and how better to use, utilize our current staff. And we think that um, with our new ILS system, which will help our workflows, we can use some of those in other areas to make better service. Um, and we want to foster, foster a reading culture with our library staff so they can, are more able to talk to people and bring them in. So that's just kind of a brief rundown of what we kind of have planned for the next three years. Our partnerships, we want to continue with the outreach. Um, we are working uh, with the city on the census 2020. We will have a computer at each morning site and downtown. Um, people can come in and they do not need a library card nor even a guest pass. We'll get them on, they can fill out their census and, and then get on their way. Any question on that? Sure. Number one, I appreciate your willingness to do that and promote that. I think it's a citywide endeavor and, you know, we all need to be rowing in the same direction. That's right. Sure. Um, the second thing that I would just say is if you can make sure to um, communicate that to your staff, you know what I mean? And just ensure that with every patron that comes in or anyone comes to the desk that maybe that's an introductory question, um, that type of thing. I think that's important. It's going to be just that's educating a great idea. staff and not just having it there. Yeah, but not being just having this time. Yeah. And saying thank you so much for coming to the library while I'm checking out your book. Have you filled out the census yet? You can actually do that online right here. It's very easy. Then you don't have to worry about waiting for it at home or anything like that. I'd that's a great idea. No, that is great. And I will be sure um, and take that back to the staff. And that's easy enough to do. So. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they do great customer service already. I'm just right. thinking 
anyone that comes in, they're obviously going to have to come up to you to either return it. Well, maybe not return, but check yeah. out the book or do that. Stuff. Yeah. If and we could, can do it. If they it. could just take the extra and talk about the ease of doing it right there and online. I mean, I just... Yeah. Make, make them some salespeople and kind of make sure that <laughs> right. they're doing it. Well, that's right a there. great suggestion. We can do it at all our service points, whether they're circling or not, when they just come up to ask, you know, information like reference questions. It would be a little in-house competition or something go on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They well, get they competitive. Yeah, winner, winner could <laughs> probably win a $25 gift certificate. To Somewhere. The so <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think we have flyers, too, you can communicate with. Um, mm -hmm. I know Kaylin Robert. <laughs> Kaylin Robert, our uh, uh, intern, is working on that. Okay. She would be willing to work with you on okay. um, if you need a flyer or anything like that. Because that's the other thing. Like, if they have questions, I want you, your staff, to be able to hand them something. Okay. But I know we've ordered some stuff from the census, and so, okay. but, um, and Jody is working uh, on some things to put online and then for staff to have at the desks. But we'll get. Cool. Yeah, um, Jesse Wakefield is our point person on the census, and she's working with the city right. and and uh, the ALA, the American Library Association, is big behind this, a big push. So Great. we're doing a lot with it. So, Thank but yeah, we uh, are just trying to uh, keep us going and keep the lights on. And you're doing well. Helen, Helen, a couple of things. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation, and thank you, and thank the Board of Trustees for the strategic plan. I think it's really important. Self self evaluation is always good to do. Right. And I really appreciate that. But just in round numbers, I'm just really curious. Overdue fines. What would be? I know you. I knew you were going to ask me that. And I'm trying to think. If we don't. It's mixed in with our loss and missing items and yeah. damaged items, but it's about forty thousand a year. But we would still charge for missing and lost and damaged items. We would still charge the replacement. This would just be overdue fines. Overdue fines. Yeah. I wrote that exact same question down. Have you, yeah, have and you, I can find out exactly. I just wonder, what, do you have any idea what your recovery rate on those fines is? No. no. Like my daughter, they just don't have the card anymore. Yeah. 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 I, you I won't say which daughter because that would embarrass. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen any programs or have you had any programs? And just relax, it's just a question. Just a question. <laughs> Where you forgive past fines, kind of start out Wait. clean. We late. did that. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, what do you call those programs? Amnesty. Amnesty. We had a uh, fine free week Mr. City Manager. when we had the grand opening at Morningside. And we forgave about, it was almost 5,000, it was 4,800 in overdue fines that week. Yeah. yeah, your daughter should have gone out there. Yeah. Out there. She missed out. <laughs> well, it's just something maybe to think right. about instead of carrying it on the books year after year right. mm -hmm. after year. Right. And well, and we it's, think it's just you know even though we only block you know once your fines get up to five dollars they don't accrue after that on overdues, but that still can be the especially for families with young children that really you know blocks the kids from coming in and we want to be able to open that up for them and so they can still come in and use the library. I mean, they can come in and use it. They just can't check out anything to take home. Yeah, I mean, with all things, if, if, if you did do that and have a forgiveness type program, I mean, you want to have some incentive to make sure you return the items. Right. Because others will use, re, will read them, use them, check them out. Right. So, but we might want to just think about something like that. Because how far back do they go, would you say? Just again, just a okay. ballpark. Well, you know, I'd have to look. The, on overdue fines, I'm sure there's stuff back 20 years on the books. Oh, I better check mine. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> go to the microfilm and find that. <laughs> Are you serious? 20 years, though. Oh, okay. yeah. No, they don't go away. Yeah. OK. Well, we, we might save them forever, us librarians. We don't to, forget. We, we might want to think about yeah. that. It, would, it really would open <laughs> exactly. the door for a lot of people, a lot of families. That's yeah. That's what we think, and it's kind of like I said. And when we get ready to do it, if the board approves it, we'll come back to the council and, and give a presentation because there's a lot of libraries that are doing it, and they have a lot of stats on how it's you know they're still getting their books back. And so, you know, they're even getting more return instead of people holding on to them, scared to come to the library. Right, right. So. Just uh, make sure you wait till after March 16th. 
Oh yeah, I have a while. We have our budget. <laughs> <laughs> budgets on on the agenda for approval. Yeah, Both yeah, no, it, it'll, so it'll be a that. while. <laughs> oh, thank you. Great thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you for waiting too. Thank you oh, very much, it. Helen. Any citizens who want to be heard, please come to the mic. State your name and address, please. Been patient. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh -huh. I'm Lynn Sullivan and Dan Indeed, Tramp. Right. Um, South Sioux City, Nebraska. Dan has several rental properties um, on the west side, Prospect Hill, Jackson Street, and um, we, it's getting progressively worse with the transient population that we have, and we're kind of on their cycle of where they go. We've had, in the last couple of years, two duplexes burned down due to transients. We, the police are called on a weekly basis. It's a nightmare for us, yeah. Yes, we have boarded up windows, we have boarded over doors, they have um, broken out one of our uh, houses, we just, this is why we're here, is because yesterday there was a, um, a hole, they <laughs> kindly left the broken doorknob at, in the house, but there's a hole about this big in the door where they pounded out the doorknob to get into the house. Um, and are these vacant properties then? They are vacant properties, vacant properties and we have done everything we can to we secure them, them. We can't rent them out because people break them, break the windows. Yeah, we have one house on Perry Street where we've got new windows, we cleaned, we painted, it's on Craigslist ready to be rented out, and there is a broken window in the back that they're crawling in and leaving their belongings there. And we're just wondering, what the city wants to do. Yeah, what are we gonna do? Because, I mean, we're losing money. Um, you know, we can we continue to fix them up, and before we can rent them, they're Very damaged. Yeah. And, I mean, Jackson Street, we are, they, they're really good. They have stolen a, or they have commandeered a drill. So they drill out the screws that we put in to cover the door, and then drill it from the inside so it looks like it's still so they're, secure. So they're carpenters. And then they're down they're there. They're on rails. <coughs> yeah. They so from, they go from burning the bridge down to coming to Jackson Street. It's a yeah. I mean, so we're just we're at a loss because we don't. I mean, we're losing money, and we would like to fix them up. We would like to rent them, but there's more of them than there are of us to get the work done. Well, I'm a big, and I don't know how the others feel, I'm a big fan of recommendations. What would you recommend or what would you <laughs> hope we could do? You know what I mean? Set the shelters down, get rid of them. These people from California, we don't even hear. They could, there's tons of them that come here. I don't know. I mean, honestly, if I had a recommendation, I would. I don't know what, I mean, we had someone tell us that they hired an off-duty police officer to patrol their areas because it was so bad. So we're having to have to hire police officers to patrol areas that they should be patrolling. I mean, you know, I have no, I have no idea if I did, I would tell you, I would, you know, it's, it's just I wonder, yeah. beyond what I can figure out. Yeah, because we have a captain sitting in the back. I was thinking about police force as well, and I don't know the other thing. I mean, thinking about my property, right, is I have cameras set up at my house that alert me anytime someone comes on my grounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you install the camera and the second you see activity, you call the police and say someone is at this property right now. Um, we, we have, we, we have on, I've taken snapshots of the camera, yeah. the video well, no, no. of them crawling into the windows, crawling yeah. out. We, I mean. And so what I'm saying though is being proactive in that moment. Like mine alerts me the moment that someone is at my house, mm -hmm. then at least then I could call Surely, if they're going to the trouble of unscrewing wood and screwing it back in place, it's not like they're going to see a cop car roll up and be like, well, I better get those, my drill out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. at least then you can catch them. Now, I will tell you, I, I'm not sure what our officers are going to be able to do after that point. I mean, obviously, you can charge them with trespassing and breaking and entering. We've or, had over 20, or we've had calls of 20 of them on Jackson Street alone. Different times that we've, they've arrested 20 of them. Probably since January. They haul them to the shelter. They'll be back there that mm -hmm. same night. I don't know if they haul them to the shelter, but 
Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Say, can, you, you going to can you move that microphone? Just make sure it's right up close to you there. Thank you very much. At least in the middle. Just Thanks. for both of you. Yeah. Um, you know, and they say, you know, well, we don't know. I mean, they have walked in and have been like, hey, what are you doing here? I mean, they know them because they just go from. They know the right? officer who comes to the house? The officer knows the oh. individual because oh. they have dealt with them probably on a nightly basis. I'll just give it a couple more minutes. And a lot of times they say we probably, you know, unless they have drugs or something on them, um, they can't, they, they don't arrest them. They just kind of take them someplace else. So, uh, yeah, if I could come up with recommendations, I'll be back next month for the board, for the council meeting, and throw them out at you. But we... Uh, Does it, them, do them transits really help the city? I can't imagine them helping at all. They're all from out, out of town. They get, they get free room and board here. If they get kicked out of the shelters, that's where they buzz into our houses. And, you know, we're, so we've got several on Prospect Hill. And if you just look down the hill and you see the. Yeah, when are you going to do something about that one, Mark? They're camped out down there, and that's ridiculous. It's a, a garbage pit. They just, they got two tents there. They're on private or public property. <laughs> <clears throat> they can't do that legally. Yeah, uh, Mark Kirkpatrick, uh, Police Department, you're right. They can't do it on public property. And the shelter is actually beneficial to us in that regard. The only reason they can't do it on pro public property based on the way the court rulings are going around the country is because we have shelter services. So we have services for folks that are homeless, um, which means they, they aren't forced to camp on the street. So. We can, we can still remove them from the public spaces. I'm not sure exactly which uh, camp you're talking about, Mayor. No, it's a, you can't miss it. The one at the bottom of the hill? Yeah. On the, on the, right by the bridge. Yeah, and that problem becomes the property owner because that's not public property right in there. So we have to have the assistance of the property owner to remove folks from that, if I'm thinking of the, the same camp. You better thinking. check because that's got to be close to our right of way. By the railroad there? Yeah, I think we have. I think the problem with that particular spot is that it's, uh, we have issues, I should rephrase that. Um, my understanding is we don't have the cooperation of the property owner to remove them. Who's that? I don't know that. Apologize. Well, anyway. I can, can find out more can about that particular case. And, and try to get some addresses to see if we can do a little extra patrol? Certainly can. All right. And I would add that the, the vacant houses are the biggest problem we see. If the house is vacant, it's very hard to keep these folks out in some of these neighborhoods. But then it's also tough for them to rent it. Yeah. I mean, I understand it's your place. How many houses are you talking about <laughs> that are your own? In, in Sioux City, are we, we spent... probably have 80 We spent 20... <laughs> our tax <packs> were 20,000 <laughs> over here. But how, you're asking how many, how many homes, how many how many homes do you property. have been broken? Property. We have probably um, 80 units, maybe some are duplexes, fourplexes, like mm -hmm. the one on Jackson Street. 40 or, 40 or 50, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, probably. We don't have a problem on the other side of the river. 30, it's all here, yeah. 30. How many are vacant? We can't rent them, so quite a few. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, approximately 40 in Sioux City? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other, the other thing I would just direct you to think about, and I don't know if you've ever looked into these programs or if it would help, um, we do have a lot of different programs to improve your, your home or make, a, make changes or recommendation, or not recommendations, improvements to the structure. You can talk with Jill Wanderscheid in community development. Is it community development? Neighborhood services. Neighborhood services, thank you. Jill Wanderscheid. Because, I mean, even just some of the appearance or different things that you do to the property maybe would help make some of those improvements, get it rented so it's occupied so then people aren't coming in. I would just, and some of them are eligible for single property owners and some are available for renters. So you could at least look into that too. So you guys, so you guys just. Neighborhood. Neighborhood services. services. So you guys are okay with all the transits <laughs> in the city? Can't, no. but we can't oh. control that, sir. I'm sorry that okay. well, we yeah. can't tell a person they, they come can't right come to California right here. They get I'm just telling you, we stay. cannot. We can't tell somebody not to come to Sioux City, and we can't tell them they have to leave Sioux City without the courts determining that. That's the problem. So, so no, we're doing. A, we're actually taking a lot of steps to address that. Okay. To be Gil, honest with you, Gil will share with you that she has one of her. Uh, uh, 
I wish I could think of her title, Darlene uh, yeah. McMullen. Uh, maybe. Coordinator. Uh, coordinator, but she's uh, the city's outreach worker. She actually goes on the street by herself, talks to all of the yeah, transits she can, Man. works with them. There was a list of 120 names, and within the last year, she's, she's assisted 30 of them with getting into detox, getting jobs, and or returning home to where they have come from. So we're, we're trying to make a real effort to uh, have an impact. But I can, if you wait long enough when this is done, it won't be long, I'll uh, give you her phone number so you can. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a suggestion for the gentleman, gentleman the lady here. Uh, for your properties, look, do like in some other places, like in California, you talk about the homeless. It's one of the homeless and people coming in, transient. It's, just, it's an uphill battle. The way you could do for your houses and for your homes, you got for rent. Put bars, those security bars you guys put on the windows and the doors. They work pretty good because I deal with people in one of my properties that just have it. It looks like it's vacant. Well, I, don't, I use it for storage and I have the same problem. You can only do so much. I had to put a, uh, I made a, uh, a door out of metal, had to weld it and put some locks in it. That's unfortunately, it doesn't look good for aesthetics, but <clears throat> that's one thing you can do. You put them on the windows, on the doors, it will help. They're gonna need a lot more, it'll, it'll deter them. It's a, pretty, a door you can get into a pretty, that's a suggestion that I got. So. Thank you. Anyone else be heard? Good evening. Kevin Green, Director of Sun District Health Department. Uh, Councilman Waters had approached Dan Wester this morning about just some things going on with the COVID-19, the coronavirus, and just what was the city doing and working. And I know she sent out a press release articulating the partnership that we've been working with. And I think part of our messaging that we're doing and working with the city, the county, and other entities is the fact that we're trying to reduce some of the anxiety related to this issue. Um, the thing is that it gets very difficult because there's such an overwhelming amount of information that is sent out and distributed through many different channels. So for example, since the time we were sat here, we had three probable cases when you started the meeting, and right now there's been confirmation that's moved up to eight. All of these within the state of Iowa, they're not in Woodbury County, however, they're related to travel. Um, but some of the things that we're working with the city in as different issues come up, we work in consulting with them. I've had staff out at the EOC that has met with city staff and other emergency operations um, individuals and staffing to give them some updates, keep them apprised. We're networking with schools. Um, we had the press conference with the Asausu City that happened earlier today related to the 12 students that had been at the Special Olympics tournament on February 29th in Fremont, Nebraska. There's a lot of things going out there, but my purpose tonight was just to come to assure that we're there, we're willing, and we're having conversations with city staff. And as different issues come up, we will begin to kind of give some advisement work with them for what is the best in the interest of the public. <clears throat> but I just want to kind of uh, come up, share that with you, just give you a heads up on that, and and um, answer any questions that anyone may have. Well, I think that is very useful right there, is to work together, get the word out, get some clear and concise communication, because that's where the frenzy starts, is yes. not knowing where these cases are coming from, and <coughs> every single case, maybe not everyone, but probably 99.9% .9 have been attributed to travel. Right, attributed travel, and the other reality of it is, is that what's more devastating is our annual influenza. Mm -hmm. That's having more of an impact on residents and fatalities than what the COVID-19 exactly. is. Right. And so I think it's just assuring people to let them know, and, and they get a little, um, a little anxious right. about some of that and gatherings and that type of thing. So I think it's very important and, we just keep that messaging going. And viruses do come and go, right? They do come they and do. go. We're just waiting to see maybe once they it warms up, this one disappears. Right. My fingers are crossed, right. but right. we'll see in time. And social media is not usually helping it, you know, these <clears throat> kinds of things. No, even with my 81-year-old mother, I've encouraged her to read past the headline she sees and actually read the article that's attached to it as right. opposed to sharing it because sometimes <laughs> those are a little misleading of what's contained right. within the article itself. So is your too. mother that's spreading this mayhem around Sioux City? Right. Um, <laughs> I've tried to... <laughs> <laughs> like anybody on social media, I have limits to my to control. To we appreciate what you're saying and, and uh, keep up the good work and try to keep the public informed because 
those of us up here don't have that ability to, yep. to know what there we're went doing. Sunday dinner <laughs> <at mom's. laughs> oh, she was watching but I agree with the mayor uh, Siouxland district health has always been a great partner uh, with the city and thank you for everything you do and thanks for stopping this evening you bet thank you thanks, have a good thank evening you. thanks Kevin <clears throat> just so council knows we're we're taking our cues from Siouxland district health and CDC and you should the information be. I sent out yep, earlier you be. yep so and yep. that's great thank okay you. Pete I got about five pages of uh, notes that uh, Dakin Schultz shared with us at the MPO meeting, but I think I'll pass. I would Wait hope you next would. week. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, cut, I'm cutting you off if you try that. <laughs> and Julie, if she hurry, we don't have to listen to Alex. <laughs> oh, that's true. Where is he? Uh, I think that I've said enough today with my concerns with zoning and building, et cetera, so I'm going to pass today. One thing, I got a copy of the railroad manual, believe it or not, from oh. the Burlington Northern uh -huh. of a page that says, the railroad should not keep an intersection block more than 10 minutes in a community. So I'm going to be getting that to you and to Jill Wonderscheid, and I want you to call the local train master and ask him why he continues to violate his own manual. Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because I had a catering delivery today with my kitchen manager. <laughs> And he sent me a text in 44 minutes later. Yep. He so showed up. I'll get that to you, Mike. It was sitting on my desk. He was when over I came by back. Arby's. I move we adjourn. Coming. Second. I got back in time for that. Got it. Yes. Aye. Aye. Redkin. Aye. Moore. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, because yeah. Burlington Northern.